Uh, welcome back, everybody, to session number three of the seminar. Uh, for those of you joining us for this seminar, for the, this episode or this session for the first time, my name is Ian Dunikin, and uh, I will be MC in this session as all of the other ones. Uh, a little bit about me again. If you've heard this before, it's going to be the same old story. Uh, Ian Dunikin, based here in Perth in Western Australia, been here for about 20 years from Ireland originally. Um, so my interests are varied across a number of different areas, which I'll speak about in a moment. My career background is military, mining, consulting, and research. And outside of that, I enjoy to do martial arts and ultra type events, such as long distance running and swimming. So my interests overlap a little bit, but they're quite varied. Uh, so I run a podcast and, a, and an onsite um, platform called Learning to Die, which is a podcast I co-host with Karen O'Regan in Ireland, looking at philosophy, history, society, sociology, culture, and philosophy. Uh, I also have Sleep for Performance, which is hosting this seminar today. This is our athletic portion of the business where we work with elite athletes. We also have a podcast called Sleep for Performance Podcast or Sleep for Performance Radio. Over 100 episodes there that you can go and check out. And we also have a Sleep for Performance channel on YouTube with lots of lectures and, and free stuff there as well that you're more than welcome to go and uh, rip off and duplicate. Uh, Melia's Consulting, which are industry-facing business, which does a lot of human factors, fatigue management, fitness for work, uh, mainly in the high-risk in the high-risk industries, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then I have two adjunct positions: one at University of Western Australia, um, and one at ECU Edith Cowan University, uh, where I work with a number of PhD students. And the three three of the four presenters today are actually work. I'm working with them and with their on their PhDs at the moment as well. So I will not be voting. I will not have a hand in giving any prize money. That's why I've recused myself from all of these activities. Uh, you can connect with me and follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Sleep for Perform, uh, LinkedIn, Google, Scholar, and Research Gear. Some of our clients, obviously, on the high risk side are the mining, oil and gas, rail, uh, aviation, uh, refining, uh, construction, and so on. And then on the elite athletic side, worked with numerous different organizations and sports teams and individual athletes across a range of different different sports, particularly particularly in combat sports, contact sports, and in uh, things like Formula One. Now, everybody is welcome to vote for your favorite speaker today. You can rate all the speaker sessions. A uh, link will be going out after these sessions. Uh, voting will close next Thursday. 50% of the overall score will come from you, the viewers, and the other 50% will come from a panel of experts. Five people are on that panel. Um, which everybody is blinded to. Nobody knows who that panel is. It's a secret panel, but they're all PhDs in the sleep area and they will be assessing all the talks as well. So please make sure you go over there and vote for or rate your speakers after the um, presentations because there is prize money on the line. 500, 300 and something else. I can't remember. can't remember why I agreed to give out. Uh, today's session is Mitchell, Tina, Michelle and Tim. And we're still waiting for Michelle to join us, um, but we're going to kick off today's session with Mitchell Turner from ECU. Mitchell, you're in the hot seat. Thank you, Ian. I'll share my screen. Okay, thank you everyone for uh, attending my presentation. My name is Mitchell Turner. I'm a PhD candidate at Edith Cowan University. And today I'm gonna to be speaking about the impact of sleep-like behavior on tennis match play performance in junior state grade tennis players. I'd first like to thank the other authors of this study, Dr. Travis Cookshank, Dr. Ian Dunnigan, and Mr. Philip Berenick. So tennis performance can be measured in a number of ways. The most common of which is simply the match result, which is whether a player won or lost. However, to further explore a player's performance, we can look at their match analytics, which includes uh, variables such as the winners and unforced errors, as well as their match activity, which includes the distances they ran and the uh, speeds they reached. So sleep-wake behavior um, has been shown to influence basketball performance in a recent study by Jordan Fox and colleagues. And they found that increased total sleep time, time in bed and sleep quality and later wake times 
significantly improved the performance of semi-professional basketball players. Whilst no studies to date have looked at the relationship between tennis performance and sleep-wake behavior, studies have shown that sleep restriction can negatively impact the tennis serve, forehand and backhand accuracy. Therefore, we sought to first describe the sleep-wake behavior of uh, tennis players, then quantify their match an analytics and activity to go along with their match results. And then we could investigate the influence of sleep-wake behavior on overall tennis performance. So we had 10 adolescent tennis players who were all competing in the Western Australian junior state grade competition, which is the highest um, junior tennis competition um, in WA. And we tested these players at two different time points during the season. The testing uh, included a baseline session where we collected the demographic information, seven nights of sleep-wake behavior monitoring, and their tennis match where we collected their match analytics and activity. So their sleep-wake behavior was measured using a wrist-worn activity monitor, which was the GT3X Actograph device, and a consensus sleep diary. Their match analytics, um, or to, de to determine their match analytics, we video recorded their matches and at a later date using a tennis scoring and statistics tracker, were able to um, determine their analytics. And for their match activity, a global positioning system device um, was worn by the players, which we downloaded and later analyzed. So in total, we had nine players who completed the testing at both time points. This included four males and five females. The demographic information that we collected included the average age, tennis experience and training hours um, of participants. And we were able to determine their chronotype using a mid sleep point uh, on three days with a sleep correction, which was originally proposed by Miriam Judah. As you can see, um, we had our players ranging from extreme to slight morning types. So firstly, we looked at the difference in sleep-wake behavior the night before the match compared to the average of the week. And for eight of the nine variables that we collected, this did not significantly differ. However, sleep fragmentation index the night before the match was significantly lower than the average of the week. And this can be clearly seen in the, in the figure here on the right with the night before the match indicated by the gray bar. We then wanted to look at the difference in sleep-wake behavior um, depending on the match result. But first, we had to separate male and female players. As male players com competed in a best of three tiebreak set match, and females in a best of two sets and a match tiebreak. So it basically means they were competing in a slightly shorter format. So for male players, we found that uh, time lights out, sleep onset time, and wake up to sleep onset had the largest um, effects on the match result. And for female players, we found that wake after sleep onset, sleep fragmentation index and sleep efficiency had the largest effect. It should be noted that sleep fragmentation index uh, for female players was the only variable to be statistically um, significant. We also looked at the difference in match analytics and activity um, between uh, match wins and losses. And um, Total points one uh, was the only variable to significantly differ for both males and female players. Um, however, I won't go into any more detail about these um, two variables as um, this wasn't the prime, is, isn't the primary aim of uh, this presentation. We then wanted to look at um, the influence of sleep-wake behavior on tennis performance, but we first had to determine what variables we would include um, as tennis performance. Um, so we chose to use total points one um, for the reasons I, I just mentioned as it um, was significantly different um, for both males and females. Um, and second serve points one and second serve receiving points one. The reason we used uh, these two um, variables is that a study by Macca Reed and colleagues found that these two variables had the largest um, influence in predicting uh, professional ATP player rankings. Um, so we thought these along with total points one were a good measure of tennis performance. 
So we found that sleep fragmentation index the night before the match had a significant relationship with the percentage of second serve points won for male players. For female players, we found that sleep latency the night before the match was significantly related to all three of our tennis performance variables. It should be noted, however, that the direction of these relationships was unexpected with greater sleep fragmentation index and sleep latency resulting in better performance. This may be due to the smaller sample size collected in this um, study uh, and further research is required to confirm um, these results. Um, however, it could also be due to the known error in reporting um, sleep latency when measured using actigraph and sleep diaries as it relies on the subjective reporting um, of each player. So in addition to the group level analysis that um, I've provided so far, we also wanted to look at an individual, um, an individual analysis. Um, the reason for this is that when we're trying to um, apply these results into practice, we're most likely going to be working with players on a one-on-one -on -one basis, especially in tennis, um, which is an individual sport. So we developed these player reports um, and you can see here that the tennis match performance variables are in the top left, along with the um, sleep-wake behavior variables that we collected. The National Sleep Foundation um, recommendations for several of the variables are indicated by the green, yellow, and red shaded areas. And using these particular variables, we were able to develop a sleep-wake behavior score um, for each player at each time point, which you can see in the top right hand of the screen. We also provided some summary information and some advice um, for this particular player um, in the bottom right hand of the screen. And we created these reports for each of the nine players um, in this um, study. So take home messages from this study are that sleep fragmentation index was the only variable to significantly differ the night before the match compared to the average of the week. That sleep quality variables such as wake after sleep onset and sleep fragmentation index had the largest effect on tennis match results. And that sleep fragmentation index and latency the night before the match were the only variables to be significantly related to tennis performance. However, further studies are needed to confirm these findings. Also, that individual, um, as, along with group analysis, um, is needed when applying this research into practice in the future. Thank you for listening to my presentation. If you'd like to know any um, more information or if you have any questions regarding this or any other research um, that I'm doing, please feel free to contact me on the links um, provided here. Thank you. Excellent, Mitchell. Very good. And you had 40 seconds to spare, so we could sit in silence for 40 seconds and try some meditation from my last <laughs> presentation earlier on. <clears throat> um, that's brilliant. Um, please, uh, for the participants uh, or even the panelists, if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen down there. You can type in questions and uh, ask. We do have some questions uh, coming in. Mitchell, one of the things, as we're waiting for some questions to come in, one of the things that strikes me about your work is that you're really trying to delve into the individual data, whereas predominantly in the sports-related literature, we've looked at group data, um, you know, averages over time or between groups, and you've kind of gone into this individual data. Can you maybe talk about why you've gone down the individual path and why it's so important? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I have to credit yourself a little bit that one as well, Ian, as um, this was uh, on the discussions we've had with you, um, one of your ideas as well. And um, the reason we've gone down this path is that, uh, especially for, for, like I said, with, with tennis, um, we're obviously working with individual um, sport athletes and that uh, everyone's seat weight behavior um, differs slightly as we know, but also um, within tennis, they're their, their performance can differ um, drastically as well. So we have different styles of players. Um, so when we're looking at uh, their tennis performance, whilst someone who maybe relies on um, a, a big serve and, and, and might have a lot of shorter points and a lot of winners, um, that might not be appropriate for everyone. So they, another player might be more defensive and, and so they're not going to hit as many winners or, or have as big a serve. So we need to sort of customise um, the the information that we're getting to the player, um, both from a sleep um, point of view um, and also a tennis performance point of view. Excellent. Thank you, Mitchell. We have some questions coming in now. So uh, from Jennifer Walsh down the road at UWF. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. H
Hi, Jen. I think I can see it from here. Uh, thanks, Mitchell. Did you look at self-reported sleep metrics from the diaries? And was there, uh, were there any relationships with these and performance? It's an interesting question. Uh, no, so for, for this particular study, we didn't look at um, the subjective sleep quality um, metrics reported in the sleep diaries. Um, one of the reasons we didn't was that uh, we had a few players who were uh, not so good at reporting the, uh, the um, or ticking the boxes for that, that particular one. So we had a bit of missing data for that. But in another study, um, that is something that we are looking at doing and we are using the subjective sleep quality and the restfulness um, questionnaires from the consensus sleep diary. Because um, yeah, we obviously realize the importance of that as well. Yeah, always a fine balance between getting people to uh, complete self-reported data. Uh, over time, very difficult. Especially Mitchell, thank you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Mitchell, thank you very much uh, for your presentation, and uh, really enjoyed that. So we're going to move on now to thank Tina, you. who's uh, down the hall from you at ECU. Uh, Tina, the floor is yours for your presentation. Thank you, Ian. Uh, so now I'm sharing my screen. Your time starts now. Okay. Can you see the PowerPoint? Okay, great. Thanks everybody. My name is Tina Yan. I'm from Edis Colvin University as well. So the today I'm gonna give a talk about fiber and about sleep because this is a protocol. So that my talk is mainly based on why we're gonna do this research study and how we're gonna do this study. So now let's start it with um, a girl named Lily's story. So Lily is a girl who is 18 years old. She's been struggling with her stomach pain for years along with her recurrent stomach pain, constipation or diarrhea, bloating, etc. And she's also got a poor sleep and anxious, depressed about herself. She has to extremely pay attention to any food on her plate. Many foods like onion, garlic, broccoli, mushroom, normal bread, milk are no go for her. Since these food will give her a flyer up. So eating out means a lot of attention and care. Therefore, she has always to find out where is the nearest restroom when she goes into a new place. So why we start with Lily's story? Because people like Lily are, are accounting 11.2% globally, which caused by a functional gastrointestinal disorder called irritable bowel syndrome, IBS. It's a chronic condition. 33% of IBS sufferers are having a sleep problem. 44% had associated mental health conditions. The ideology remains unclear still, but our gut is having a part of the reason of it. So now let's have a look at our gut. Human gut inhabits a large amount of microbes, 10 times higher than the number of human body cells. The gut microbiome analysis suggests considerable differences between healthy population and IBS patients say certain alterations of the bacterial richness and diversity. Then how do we deal with this currently? So dietary triggers are reported to be central to symptom generation in more than half percent, in more than half of the patients with IBS. For many years, they are doing this with dietary management, focusing on altering their specific dietary components so they are doing a dietary called low FODMAP diet. This is an effective, effective dietary treatment. So this FODMAPs means fermentable, oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. So basically they are some small and poorly absorbed in the small Molecules, poorly absorbed in small intestinal, but rapidly fermentable in the proximal column. But uh, there are some long-term risks of long-term low FODMAP use, such as nutritional inadequacy, in insufficient intakes of total dietary energy, fibers, and micronutrients, and also it can 
they have some imbalance of gastrointestinal microbiome. They can rapidly alter the gut microbiome community. A low form of diet does not contribute to a return of microbial abundance and diversity. It could rapidly and negatively shift the gut microbial community, either for a healthy group of, of people or for IBS patients. Low form of diet can alter our gut microbiota. It can reduce beneficial bacteria and production of short chain fatty acids. So what's the relationship between dietary fiber and microbiota? Dietary fiber is fermented by our gut. Through this fermentation, it can produce short chain fatty acid. Butyrate is one of these three types of short chain fatty acid. Butyrate plays a role, an important role in preserving our gut barrier function as a major fuel for co colonic cells and, and have a major fuel for uh, have anti-inflammatory properties. It can cross blood brain barriers and indirectly affect host appetite and influence the neurotransmitter production. Therefore, we are hoping we using fiber fix to be a solution for these IBS patients. What is fiber fix then? Fiber fix is a combined dietary fiber. So it could, we hoping it could carry dietary fiber to the, prox, uh, the proximal column area to generate more short chain fatty acid. So here is a bit of summary. We've already known that low FOMAP diet is a restrictive dietary pattern and it's effectively reduced IBS symptoms. But if we're using it in the long term, it can negatively impact our gut microbiota. And we are hoping fiber fix supplement may improve it by increasing our gut fermentation and short chain fatty acid. And then hope fiber fix could improve gut health, sleep, and mental health. Therefore, we are aiming to provide this fiber fix, which is a, a combination of dietary fiber to solve these problems. So the objective of this research study is to determine in patients with IBS and also on a low FODMAP diet, whether fiber fix can improve their microbiome diversity, uh, fecal butyry concentrations, sleep quality, quality of life, and mental well-being. So about the study design, we designed this study as a randomized double-blinded placebo-controlled trial. After screen, screening and ensure those participants are eligible, they will be randomly assigned into two groups. So from this slides, we can have the overall concept of this research journey. Before intervention, we will measure these atoms at time point one. We, were, we are collecting their bell samples of their 24-hour stool samples and fasting blood sample. We are collecting their diet records, three-day weight with diet di diary. And then we measure their uh, body weight and body fat ratio and ask them to complete some questionnaire in sleep, mental health, quality of life, and IBS symptoms. And during three weeks of fiber intervention, we asked them to do a daily symptom checklist to score their symptoms, like how they are feeling of their stress level, how they are feeling of their constipation, bloating, diarrhea, things like that. And also they're gonna wear the, the sleep tracking device to give us the sleep data. And then after three weeks of the intervention, we were gonna re redo those assessment, assessment, which we do at the time point one. So this will give us the results at their time point two. So outcomes, generally we separate them into primary outcomes and secondary outcomes. So first is our fecal short chain fatty acid and gut microbiota from the stool, uh, stool samples we're collecting. And secondary outcomes, 
we are looking at their objective sub and subjective sleep measures. So things like total sleep time, sleep, effic sleep efficiency, sleep latency, and we are collecting sleep questionnaires. We are collecting five sleep questionnaires, things like the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index and Insomnia Severity Index. And then we are, collect we are using four questionnaires to measure their mental health, like Data 21 and IBS specific quality of life. And about their GI symptoms, so we are using bowel symptoms questionnaire and daily symptom checklist. And anthropometry, we're measuring their body mice and wisdom height ratio and testing their fat mass ratio. So we are expecting compare with the com control group. We're hoping participants who, who complete the three week intervention with fiber fix will have a better gut health, better sleep, better mo uh, mental health, and not exacerbate their gut symptoms. So thanks for listening. And please ask me if you got any questions. Thanks, everyone. Excellent. Thanks, Tina. You finished with one second to spare. Well done. <laughs> thanks to you. <laughs> so um, thank you very much for that, Tina. Uh, if anybody has any questions, please type them into the Q&A box down the bottom, please. Uh, with any presentations as we're going along, if you have any questions, you can type in the questions at any time. You don't have to wait until the speaker has finished. Um, as we're waiting for some of those questions to come in, Tina, this is a very new area. Not many people have looked at the relationship with nutrition and sleep. Um, what, what has been some of the challenges that you have faced over the last couple of years trying to collect this data? Because obviously this was a protocol paper. So you designed this as a protocol methodology. Uh, what sort of challenges have you had enacting this paper? I this think, experiment? thanks for it. Uh, thanks for this a great question, Ian. Because I feel like the most challenging things is, uh, is the recruitment. Mm. So because our recruitment was happening during the pandemic years last year and a part of this year. So it's really hard to find uh, participants who is eligible and who really willing to join this study. Excellent. We have a question here from uh, Trent yeah. Watson. Hey, Trent. Do you think that benefits mm -hmm. that fiber provides will be, will be the improvements in stress, which then has a subsequent benefits on sleep? Uh, yes, we hopefully we can see some good results. Our fiber fakes can improve their or making their feeling less stressful. And this is one of the daily checklist questions because we're asking them to uh, sort of using their uh, their phone to self-report their, their stress level from zero to 10. So zero means you're feeling non-stressful today and 10 means the worst. So, and then we got the daily data of their stress level to analyze the association between um, the, the sleep and the diet and things like that. Excellent. Tina, thank you very much for your presentation. Really appreciate it. Um, Really appreciate you taking the time to put that together. Thank I know you. it's very detailed. We are now going to switch over to Michelle Biggins. Uh, Michelle is based in a country where I came from, Ireland. Um, so Michelle, as with all the other speakers, you got 10 minutes and five minutes for Q&A. And we'll uh, hand over um, the, the reins to you. And uh, off you go. <laughs> Follow your own thing. Um, can you all see my screen there? That's good. Yeah, cool. Uh, so thanks, Medellin, for organizing this. It's a great opportunity to actually connect with people in challenging times when you're putting research out there. It's so a great opportunity to do so. Um, my name is Michelle, and I just recently finished my PhD in May, and I'm graduating this month. So uh, this is my fourth paper for my PhD, <laughs> thanks, Ian, um, which is currently under review. Um, so I'm going to go through that today. I apologize in advance. You know, I have a two week old baby in the house. So if my <laughs> I'm literally going through what happens when you go through sleep deprivation. So I apologize for that if I stumble over words. Um, so the my paper is the impact of long haul travel across 
multiple time zones on the sleep and recovery in elite male and female soccer athletes. Um, so an introduction around this area for people who aren't familiar with it. Um, in elite athletes, they are required to travel a lot for their sport. So whether that is to competition, whether it's to training camps, um, and this long haul travel can result in a lot of sleep disruption, um, can also contribute around a buildup of travel fatigue across the season and also um, can result in jet lag, depending on the number of time zones that are crossed. So in this area, what we looked at and identified was a lack of research in female elite athletes, um, particularly around sleep and travel. Um, there is also a, an absence of in general in female athletes in sports science literature. So again, it's just an area that I feel really needs a lot more um, attention where we can. Um, sleep hygiene is often touted as a really important factor um, in managing sleep disruption, whether that is in the home environment for athletes or whether it's when we travel, but we don't have a lot of observational data of sleep hygiene in competition. Um, so in a competition environment like an Olympics kind of setup um, where athletes are all living together, which is essentially what this paper was. So we wanted to get a baseline of what that looks like. Um, there is also an absence, or so a lack of field based studies that are replicating what's actually happening in the current elite systems within different countries. So as Ian said, I'm based in Ireland. Um, I'm a high performance sports physiotherapist with the Sports Institute. So working a lot with elite athletes and then traveling with athletes then as well to different countries. So then this opportunity came up to, to run this study. So we, excuse me here. Um, so we looked at it around the World University Games. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but um, the World University Games are a, uh, an international competition that's second in size to the Olympics. Um, it consists of about 11 to 12,000 athletes living in an Olympic village set up for about three weeks. Um, it's on a high performance pathway for a lot of, of athletes and it's held every two years. So this was our environment. We traveled from Ireland to Taiwan um, across two flights, across seven time zones. We had athletes from different sports, but we just focused on elite uh, soccer teams or male and female athletes. We had 21 male athletes and 21 female athletes, and their mean age was around 21.4 years. Um, as would be the case with a lot of these, again, more of a field based kind of approach with it, with it is that all of the athletes received uh, a one hour pre travel uh, education session on how to manage jet lag and how to manage sleep disruption. Um, so this is an overview of our data collection. Um, we had three different time points. So we had our baseline in July. You can see there, so the red rectangle is the men's baseline monitoring and the green is the women's baseline monitoring. The monitoring was a, a daily monitoring where we had, uh, we used uh, actigraphy watches, sleep diary, and then other measures around jet lag, fatigue, pre-sleep tension, anxiety, training load, recovery, readiness to train, and lots of different factors across there. Um, we then had a bit of a, a washout period for the start of August, and then we all flew to Taiwan on the 12th um, of August. We deemed the first five days as a pre-competition period because we hadn't any matches at that stage, and then both teams started their matches from um, the 18th, and we deemed that the competition period. So we looked at those three time points um, and compared these monitoring factors that we had down here on a daily basis. So from our results, um, I suppose just to talk a little bit around compliance, because I think this is an important factor. We're often, you know, wanting to include objective data and objective monitoring within this, but it can be quite challenging. And it's been kind of shown on other papers when we're doing it over a period of time, what is that compliance like within athletes? We find very high compliance within the subjective monitoring, so the daily diaries and reporting and checking in from there. Um, but as you can see, as we went on through the competition, that compliance with the um, actigraphy data went down to 32% into that competition period. So I think it's 
going forward, if I was doing it again, it's something that I would be looking into more again, potentially how can we improve this compliance or what do we need to educate the athletes on or is it feasible for even uh, longer term studies. Um, so our main results here um, of interest would be that we had found significantly decreased time in bed, um, decreased sleep duration and decreased sleep quality in the pre-competition period compared to the competition period and the baseline period. So that would translate at around this sleep duration. Looking at that, the mean difference would have been on average about a 28 minute mean difference um, compared to the other times. Time in bed was about 35 minutes less on a daily basis. Um, and there was also significantly earlier wake time, um, which would be expected and corresponds with the decreased time in bed. So there was significant sleep disruption for those first five days in that pre-competition period. Our jet lag symptoms, um, so we just used one question, one question from the, the Liverpool John Moore questionnaire. Um, they were quite low in terms of, this is a 10 point scale and they were all below that five point scale to start. However, um, in general, like there's a, a kind of Eastman's rule of thumb in that it takes about a day per hour across for eastward travel. Um, so we would have expected jet lag to have subsided by around day seven. However, for some athletes, even though it was quite low symptoms in terms of severity, some of them went up to nearly two weeks post travel. So I suppose that was an interesting, an interesting finding from that side. Looking at the sleep hygiene behaviors, um, ED on the bottom, that's electronic device use. Um, so there was significantly decreased electronic device use in the pre-competition and competition period, and also decreased caffeine intake, again, in the pre-competition and competition period compared to baseline. Now, whether that is related to pre-travel sleep education or not, we don't know. Um, however, despite this, there was still significant sleep disruption. So I suppose what we're saying from this is that um, sleep hygiene changes might not be su sufficient to mitigate the challenges of sleep disruption related to jet lag. Um, but just an interesting aside from there. In terms of our recovery and well-being, um, we didn't find any changes in subjective recovery or physical and mental readiness to train at any of the three time points. Um, and there was no change in illness or injury between the three time points. I suppose this would point to kind of other researchers who have identified that young healthy athletes are probably quite resilient to travel and to long haul travel um, and that they are in a state where they are preparing for competition and mentally and and physically quite prepared to compete now in saying that we didn't include performance measures so we can't say anything from that that aspect um, looking at our male and female groups so there was no different in objective sleep measures However, females reported greater pre-sleep tension anxiety at all time points. Um, and I suppose this is interesting if we're looking at designing sleep interventions for athletes and potentially around female athletes is that there might be um, an element where we need to look at reducing cognitive arousal for female athletes, potentially. Again, this is a small study um, and we do need more data on our female athletes. Females also reported greater use of sleep medication post-travel. Um, and again, no athletes were using sleep medication at baseline. Practical implications, there's significant sleep disruption for up to five days post-travel. Jet lag symptoms were very low, but they continued for up to two weeks in some athletes. Recovery and readiness to change, readiness to train was unchanged. Um, sleep hygiene improved in terms of decreased electronic device use and caffeine intake. However, sleep remained disrupted for the pre-competition period. Um, and females, as I said, reported greater pre-sleep tension anxiety and greater use of sleep medication. Future research, it will be fantastic to see multi-center longitudinal studies across sports, um, across countries, and particularly in those who travel regularly for their sports really need to include more female athletes around this type of area. Um, and this was an area that I think deserves more attention within this is around qualitative research, particularly because 
some of the objective tools that we're using or the validated outcome measures aren't, I think, touching on the nuances that exist within travel to these kind of competition environments where we tried to include a focus group within this study, but it just wasn't feasible. Um, and I think that would be a significant area to look into, including performance measures that are affected um, by acute sleep loss, such as scale ac um, execution and reaction times would be interesting rather than looking at the gross measures around grip strength and things like that. And that's it from me. Again, you can contact me through here. And a special thanks to my co-authors, Roshan Callan, Pete Fowler, Helen uh, Pertle, and Kieran O'Sullivan. Excellent. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, we do have some questions here from Robert Phillips. Robert asks, does the use of sleep medication have an impact on drugs in sport rules? Um, yes. So there are, it, it's all under WADA. So the uh, Olympic, or the not Olympic, but the world kind of doping agency with it. Um, it's under the discretion of the, the sports physician within the team. Um, so depending on what they allow, but there are certain allowances that they can use prescription medication um, with it. They're, within certain countries, the use of melatonin is over the counter. Um, and some of that isn't, I suppose, as um, clean, I suppose, as it should be. So there'd always be precautions around that as well, um, because you, they don't know exactly what they're taking in. So we'd always advise it has to go through sports meds physician. Yeah, um, that's that's a, that's a great answer there and a good point to make as well, because you're right, in Canada and US, you can buy melatonin over the counter, but we don't know what's mm. in there or the vats that it's been met in. So if you're an, an elite athlete, you need to be very careful that you don't test positive for some other sort of uh, supplementation. Uh, it's probably a good point time to note as well that Michelle uh, and I and many other people have uh, collaborated on a document or a paper that's just been published in the last few weeks. It's open access and it's called Managing Travel Fatigue and Jet Lag in Athletes, a review and consensus statement. So many, uh, many of these questions around jet lag and how to manage jet lag with lots of practical examples are actually detailed in that consensus statement. So I've just put it in here to the chat to, on the answers as well. But um, if you just Google that, you will, you will find that paper free of charge to download. It's quite, quite an extensive uh, paper with about 20 million authors on it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. um just got a few more moments here so if anybody's got any questions please type them in i do have a question for you michelle as well as we're waiting for maybe other people I, I think it's an interesting point you make about the female athletes there's definitely a lack of research with female athletes um i'm blowing my own trumpet here uh, i've done some work with the perth links a basketball team here in perth and what i found was kind of similar to your data in terms of they slept you know the high amount of sleep duration compared to male athletes. Um, and I know you didn't have any statistical significance there between them, but I'm just wondering we, with your athletes, were they individuals or team-based? Was there any difference between them? And do you have any speculation about why females generally tend to get more sleep than, than males from the limited data we've seen so far? Mm. So, so there's a nice systematic view where they're looking at like the objective data between male and female uh, sleep athletes. I can't pronounce his author, Valen Ahoyas or something like that. So female athletes seem to, on average, are getting about 7.5 hours sleep per night, whereas male athletes are getting about 7.3. Um, so again, we're saying, that, is that not statistically significant? But that's kind of where they're sitting. Yeah, with yeah. It. So it seems to be, and again, within, compared to the general population, is that female athletes or females seem to need to get that little bit more sleep duration. Um, and seem to, but seem to report a little bit poorer sleep quality or seem to be more when we dive in more into then their subjective experience of sleep, which is also very important, um, seem to report slightly poorer on those markers. So I think a combination of the two would be really important for going forward. I would have said that the females were actually more disciplined than the men. But anyway, that's, oh, that's really? my experience. Yeah. That's my experience. Yeah. But I, I think the difference with rugby teams, as well. So, yeah, it depends yeah. on the sport. Rugby teams and yeah. complex sports are a little bit crazy. And uh, the final question I have for you here is from Joanna. Would other variables such as change of diet if the athlete travels abroad need to be considered? So I presume yeah. what Joanna means is like maybe going from, you know, a classic Irish uh Mm -hmm. bacon potatoes meal as we, as we get characterized for to go and eat like you know uh chinese cuisine potentially and everything yeah. yeah um yeah i mean 
ideally say we would have had a nutritionist into them as well whereas they would have been advised to stick very much to their normal diet and elite athletes would really be focused on that of not changing outside of what they normally would but now within travel and I suppose Tina would know more about this than I would but that with flight that can disrupt kind of their gastrointestinal um, sim- symptoms and that can be part of their jet lag experience as well so ideally it would be something we would have looked at but it was just the feasibility wise it wasn't possible for us within all the variables we were already looking at yes the classic researcher dilemma we can't do everything we'd, we'd love what to do everything off? yeah we'd love to do everything <laughs> yeah. um yeah okay thank you very much michelle we are now going to go to our last presenter who is also at the university of limerick but hails from here in perth western australia Mr. Tim Smitties. Tim is doing two sessions today, and this will be the first of his two talks. He will be closing out this session number three and then kicking off session four later on with some of his jet lag work. Uh, so Tim, will hand over to you for uh, your presentation to close out this session. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, I'll just share my screen now. Can you hear me okay? Oh, you sharing screen? Am I good? Okay. Awesome. So yeah, thank you, Ian. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, today I'm going to be discussing a systematic review we undertook and uh, we recently published in Sleep earlier this year, um, looking at the impact of sleep restriction on cognitive performance within this specialized elite cognitive performer group. Um, just quickly about me, um, as Ian said, I completed my uh, undergraduate and honours study at the University of Western Australia, um, supervised by Ian, as well as Dr. Jen Walsh and Professor Peter Eastwood. And I'm currently uh, doing my PhD here at the Esports Science Research Lab in the University of Limerick in Ireland um, on an IRC or Irish Research Council employment-based scholarship with Logitech as the employment mentor. So there's a wealth of evidence that supports the idea that sleep loss leads to an overall decrease in cognitive performance. Um, as researchers, and particularly if we're kind of concerned about the real world implications of the these performance deficits, uh, we want to go a little bit deeper and what, think about what factors actually influence this performance loss. Uh, the first being the type of sleep loss. So the most commonly studied uh, form of sleep loss is total sleep deprivation, which is a total elimination of sleep. Um, but acute sleep restriction or one or more days of insufficient sleep is actually uh, much more ecologically relevant. Um, the other part of sleep loss is that not all aspects of cognition or cognitive domains are equally affected by, uh, by sleep loss. So simple, res- uh, repetitive kind of response to stimuli tasks that tax vigilance, uh, such as the PVT, um, appear especially sensitive to sleep loss compared to more complex tasks. Um, as this figure here shows, which was taken from a recent meta-analysis on the general population uh, for sustained attention. Um, we've labeled these types of tasks low salience in our research. In terms of the more complex tasks, uh, though they don't appear as sensitive to sleep loss, um, there's been recent evidence that suggests that tasks which demand adaptation to kind of a changing task dynamic or flexibly shifting between two or more task dynamics, which we've called high salience flexible here, are more sensitive to sleep loss versus those that don't involve those components, uh, which we've, we've called high salience stable. Um, examples of high salience stable would be uh, tests would be like a logical reasoning test where the rule always stays the same. Um, and for high salience flexible, it could be like a military drill where the, the color that kind of rep- uh, resembles friendlies and enemies changes throughout the task and uh, participant needs to adapt to this. Or maybe a multitask as well where participants have to shift their attention between many different tasks at once. Now, as I discussed, uh, there's been work and reviews on the literature uh, for the effects of sleep restriction on performance within the general population. Uh, But there's a subset of the population uh, to which kind of optimizing this performance um, on very cognitively intensive tasks is absolutely vital for success or um, even the avoidance of catastrophe. Um, And these individuals alarmingly are also kind of those that are at risk of experiencing sleep restriction as a function of their occupation. Uh, We've labeled this group of individuals here as elite cognitive performers. Um, This includes, for example, active military, um, surgeons, and highly trained athletes as well. And we just note here um, a few papers that provide evidence for enhanced cognitive, um, of enhanced cognitive performance outside of the occupational context, so in the lab uh, for these groups that are included. 
So just to summarize, we know that sleep loss and specifically ecologically relevant sleep restriction uh, negatively impacts cognitive performance uh, with tasks being differently impacted depending on their demands. Uh, we also know that due to occupational demands um, and for this, for this group, um, that cognitive performance is paramount and they're more likely uh, to experience sleep restriction compared to the general population. So given this, uh, we wanted to explore the effects of sleep restriction on cognitive performance within this population. Uh, we hypothesized that performance on these kinds of simple, what we labeled as low salience tasks will be more negatively affected within this, within this group compared to um, more complex tasks. And again, on those more complex tasks, those that kind of demand uh, cognitive flexibility uh, will be more negatively affected compared to those that don't. So we performed a systematic search, uh, which spanned over six scientific literature databases, um, as well as targeted gray literature searches as well. Um, and I've just presented the, the Prisma flowchart here on the left. Um, the crux of the search criteria will be displayed on the right. So the participants must have been in this elite cognitive performer group. Uh, studies must have compared performance on a sleep, uh, sleep restriction condition, which we defined here as one to seven nights of two to six hours sleep. Um, to a baseline condition of greater than six hours. Um, the sleep restriction could be experimentally induced or as a result of an abrupt event. So for example, um, a 24 hour medical resident shift where they were only able to attend um, to attain say three hours during the night of their shift. And then the outcome must have been either a neuropsychological test or an occupation specific, a very cognitively demanding task. Um, and performance of these tasks must match up closely between baseline and sleep restriction in terms of time of day. And this was just to minimize any kind of uh, effective time of day uh, confounding, confounding our, um, our results. And I've included this slide uh, from just before here again to show how we broke up the cognitive tests and tasks. So we had, again, we had low salience, high salience stable and high salience flexible. Uh, this slide is just a breakdown of the data uh, within the articles that were included in the analyses. So uh, mean sleep duration when sleep restriction was experimentally induced, which in the bar chart on the bottom, in the bottom right hand corner, it's the left bar, uh, was just under four hours, uh, was just over four hours when it was observed, not induced, which is the middle bar there. And then the mean uh, baseline mean sleep was just over seven hours. We had nine studies in total that, uh, that use these low salience cognitive tests uh, with seven of these nine reporting a decrease in performance um, following sleep restriction compared to baseline measures. Um, on the occupation specific tasks, however, only one study of three reported an effect. And uh, an interesting point to note here is that of the three studies that reported an effect, um, two had an, uh, an added external motivation component. So one as a monetary reward for good performance and one in the form of a long weekend holiday for, for those that performed well. Um, on the high salient stable tasks in contrast, uh, only one study found a decrease in performance on a cognitive test. And this was actually on a working memory test that another study that was included found no effect on. Um, and then for the, for the, for the occupation-specific tasks, there was one that found an effect on fine motor skills um, on the surgery simulator as well. And then for the flexible tasks, uh, performance on a multitask test and a simulated military drill, like the one I described earlier, um, changed or decreased following sleep restriction compared to baseline, while performance on a dual NVAC task for pilots and a complex kind of uh, distillation task for uh, an, an oil refinery simulator um, showed no effect uh, when sleep restricted compared to baseline. So from the current literature, um, it seems that these kind of simple, monotonous, boring type tasks are of the greatest concern for, these elite, for this elite cognitive performer group, um, which is consistent with other reviews and their analyses in the wider population. Um, secondly, it seems that although th those tasks that do tax one's ability to flexibly kind of change between shift uh, task dynamics might be more sensitive to sleep restriction uh, for th these individuals, there just wasn't enough research uh, captured within uh, the current review to kind of state this with any form of confidence. 
Um, and additionally, we highlight here two points of interest uh, which future research could target to extend our understanding of these relationships for on sleep, uh, of sleep restriction on performance for those that it matters most for. Um, the first is exactly how and to what extent this kind of external motivation factor, which we saw present in a few of the studies, um, what role this can play in the relationships. The second one, and uh, the more interesting one, in my opinion, anyway, is um, the role that task expertise has to play, uh, particularly for these kind of occupation specific tasks, is that those that are experts on a given task and have had a ton of hours um, on a task able to maintain performance despite a sleep deficit, kind of like the idea of, oh, I can, um, I can do it with my eyes closed. Does that extend to sleep loss or are these experts kind of more affected? Um, and I believe, and we kind of highlighted this in the article, um, the esports, which refers to competitive organized video gaming, um, would actually be a really interesting and perfect medium to explore this idea in. Uh, this is for many reasons, um, just namely the, the sheer size of it and, and, and amount of participants, um, kind of the accurate continuous measures of player ability um, within it. So we know exactly how good a player is meant to be. Uh, the well-researched large cognitive demands of the, of the games that are played themselves and uh, the controlled laboratory-like experiment that esports are normally played in. Uh, when people are playing esports, it's basically like they're doing a cognitive test on the computer. So there's, there's a lot of similarities there. So that's kind of an interesting, um, an interesting avenue that we see. So yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you all for listening to my presentation. Uh, just wanted to give a, give a shout out to uh, uh, my supervisors, Dr. Dr. Adam Toth and Dr. Mark Campbell for helping me as well as, uh, as, well as yourself, Ian, um, and Dr. John Caldwell as well, and uh, research assistant in our lab, uh, Magdalena Cole. Excellent. Thank How you. come everybody gets called doctor and I don't get called Dr. Tim? Did I not? No, well, there you go. That's okay. We'll mark you down for that one. Dr. Okay, Ian C. Dr. Ian C. Dunican. <laughs> Don't ask what the C stands for. Uh, Tim, thank you very much uh, what, for that presentation. Really thought provoking. If you have any questions, please uh, bang them into the Q&A uh, when you get a chance there, please. Tim, you brought back some bad memories of the military for me. For me. Uh, sleep deprivation, trying to make decisions, and more importantly, getting screamed and roared at. Um, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, Tim, what other sports do you think this may be applicable to? Straight away, I thought of Formula One. Is there any other sports you think this, this research may be applicable to that people could actually use this framework in? Yeah, um, Formula One would be a very, a very, very good and kind of um, that would be the that would be the one that I go to as well as, as obviously other other racing um, racing sports as well. I think those that kind of tend to go a bit more, I mean, I guess those that increase in complexity, um, particularly team sports, and kind of go a bit further away of uh, away from just pure physical performance per se um into kind of something that would involve tactics something that would involve an opposition because then if you've got an opposition you have a, a team which might uh, might might kind of uh come in with a different tactic than you expect and then that's mm. you having to adapt to a changing task dynamic that's you having to adapt to something that maybe you haven't practiced to practice for yet or something where you've got um factors that can change very rapidly such as weather for example again formula one weather changes how you drive um in rugby, for example, weather changes how you play and you have to adapt to that. Um, so I think those kind of team sports as well as um, as well as racing sports, which you've, uh, which you've pointed out there. And what about industry applications, Tim? Any industries that you think this work may be applicable to? I'm thinking again, maybe like nuclear power plants in the control rooms, decision-making where the consequences can be quite disastrous or thinking about health and safety incidents where fatigue has been an issue. Uh, Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, uh, many of these things, Exxon Valdez that we've seen over the years. Yeah, um, I definitely think uh, like stuff like nu nuclear power plants, um, kind of, yeah, just any process operators that are in a potentially kind of, cat that they're in an environment that could be catastrophic if, if um, things do, if things do, do go wrong. And that's kind of why we wanted to target um, this kind of population in particular. Um, Again, pilots and air traffic controllers would be a very important one oh, yeah. um, as well. Um, there's some good research out there. There's, uh, I think, four to eight percent um, of uh, airline kind of catastrophes are um, in some way a result of fatigue, which is quite alarming. So it's definitely relevant to those individuals um, as well. 
um, as well as as well as surgeons and, and medical staff, which we know are quite often on very difficult schedules and are coming into shifts with with a, with a with a following sleep restriction and with a sleep debt. Yeah. So the next time you're having surgery, you might want to ask the uh, physician surgeon what was going on the night before. Maybe not a Monday morning might be the best time to have your surgery, especially if it's after a, a holiday weekend. Uh, Joanna has asked a question here, Tim, as a health professional who has done many years of night duty or oh, Joanna, I am sure the reward to complete the study would have affected the results. Motivation reward after a night on duty is usually pretty low. Was there a reason you introduced this into your study? Um. So we didn't necessarily, that's a, that's a great, uh, great question and a great point. I think the, that that external motivation component is, is important, um, is, is, is obviously very important. Um, we didn't necessarily in, introduce it into the study per se, as we just, because it was a systematic review, we were, we were scouring the literature and this is what these, what these um, kind of studies reported, um, reported to have. Um, so I think it, yeah, I, th I do think it would play a massive part. And I think as well, and, that, and quite a lot of the literature has touched on it um, as to possibly the reason why those kind of simple, uh, the tasks that ta tax vigilance, such as the, the, the PVT, for example, it is quite boring. Um, and so that's, that's an idea of why, that's, that's an idea that quite a few people have as to why those tasks are more sensitive compared to something that's a bit more complex and maybe a bit more engaging. Um, that's uh, th that don't seem to have as much of an effect so um yeah we didn't necessarily kind of include it per se it was it was what was uh, within the literature that was and that ended up being in the review excellent thank you very much tim and thank you to michelle thank you to tina and to mitchell for those four great presentations all very different and thought provoking excellent session uh, thank you very much we will be having our session number four our final session um in about two hours uh, so at 7 p.m. here in the west of Australia, uh, which will be, I think, about midday in the UK and Ireland. So we got Tim back on. He's going to be talking about his jet lag work with the Super Rugby team, the Western Force, around the world in 16 days. It's quite uh, from the domestic competition. Uh, Dr. Anshu will be on from the impact of lockdowns um, during COVID in a small Indian population. Uh, Ronan Doherty will be on from Ireland talking about sleep and recovery practice of athletes. Ronan was recently on the Sleep for Performance podcast as well. And Gemma Maisie will be on talking about her research in mining, digging for data, how sleep losses lose now to roster design and sleep disorders and lifestyle factors. To date, that's the biggest study done in mining globally. And um, so it makes for a very interesting session to close out the seminar. So with that, I'll let you all go to have breakfast, lunch or dinner, and uh, we'll meet back in two hours. Thank you very much, everybody.